Well, good morning, Northview. Hey, it's so good to have all of you here today. Thank you for giving us a part of your weekend. Uh, you heard Micah talk about we're one church in 11 different locations. One of those locations is our Benford campus at 65th and Benford. And uh, they've been in a temporary setting. And uh, on Easter, they moved into their permanent uh, auditorium. And so last weekend, uh, I went down and spent uh, Sunday with them. It was just uh, incredible to see all that God is doing down there. And Steve Carter preached here. Was that not an incredible message or what? God, man. And so I was with the folks at Benford, the good folks at Benford, and we're excited about that. And our grand opening won't be until September because we still are working on the children's area. But once that's completed, we'll have a grand opening. And maybe some of you will want to come and support that. But um, I was just excited about all that God's doing with them. You know, um, if you've been here very long, you hear me talk oftentimes about my grandkids who are the pride and joy of my life. Um, I have seven grandkids, for those of you that don't know, and if you need to know more, I'll be glad to share more with you later. But I have seven grandkids, and one of the things I started doing with them when they were two years old is down in my basement in the storeroom, uh, there's a wall where there's, it's, the frame is showing. And so I took one, two before, one stud on, for each grandchild, and we measure them. That's their growth stick. And so we go down there on their birthday every year and we measure how much they've grown. And of course, when it's their birthday, they're quick to remind and say, Papa, we haven't measured me yet. We need to go down. So we'll go down and measure them. And then, my, and then their parents oftentimes will come down with their phones and they're taking pictures of it. And you say, well, why in the world would they be taking pictures of it? Because guys, growth is a big deal. Growth is a big deal. And just like our physical growth is a big deal, so is our spiritual growth. That's a big deal as well. And that's why last year we came along with the growth plan and we said, you know what, we wanna partner with you to help you grow in your faith. And just as we care about and we're concerned that we're growing physically, we should care and be concerned that we're growing spiritually. And so we have this uh, 90 day growth plan that we do in cycles, so every, in a 90 day cycle. And I'm hoping that all of you will engage, that all of you will be a part of this so that you can take your next level of spiritual growth. So uh, in your uh, worship guide, there is this card. If you'd pull that out, I wanna point out some things on this card if I could. Uh, on the one side, it says, seize this moment of solitude. Seize this moment of solitude. Now, the thing that I love about our growth plan is that it's unique to you, meaning that it's not one plan fits all. And the frustrating thing about that is that sometimes, for instance, with your spouse, if you're married, you might say, you know, where I need to grow spiritually is not where my spouse needs to grow. They need to grow in another area. And yet oftentimes when we have one, one plan fits all, uh, it doesn't work in your life. I hope that makes sense. And so this is designed so that it's unique to your place in life spiritually. And so what you do, you've got this where it says disciples of Jesus, these are 10 attributes. And you go down this list and you're like, okay, which one of these areas am I the weakest in? Which one of these areas do I need to grow the most in? So you go down the line, you pick it, and then there's instructions on all this. Then you go online and it'll, it'll pull up a plan designed just for you in that particular area. I love it. It works great. And so <clears throat> what I'm going to do here for just a minute is that I want you to take a look at this right now while I'm talking about it. And I want you just to read down this list and just see if the Lord doesn't whisper one of these things in your ear and say, that's an area you need to work on. And so you take just a minute and you do that. And then uh, after a minute, I'm going to pray over this if we could. So just look at that for a minute, if you would. Father, I just thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness in our life. And I thank you, Lord, that you love us just the way we are. 
And yet at the same time, God, it's your heart's desire that we would grow, that we would grow in the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we would become more like you. So I just pray for everyone in this room, God, that you would give us the desire, that you would give us the courage and the boldness, that you would give us the drive that we need to take the next step in our spiritual journey. That God, we would, I pray against apathy or indifference, that God, we would just um, make the steps necessary, the spiritual disciplines necessary to grow in our walk with you. Thank you, God, that you love us. We pray it all in the name of Jesus, amen. So guys, um, after the service then, we have uh, out in all of our campuses, out in the atrium, we have the new growth uh, plan, the new um, uh, journal, if you will, and they're all new devotionals, and this is a 90-day cycle. And so I just want to encourage all of you to pick one of these up. They're $7. That's what it cost us to put these together. And so uh, two things, let me say about that. If you say, Steve, I, I can't afford $7, then just pay whatever you can afford to take one. You say, no, I, I can't afford anything. Then just take one. Seriously, I, I want, I'm so much more concerned about your spiritual growth than I am the money on this. And we just want you to take this and get started. Second thing, I'm so convinced that this will help you grow that here's the challenge I would make. If you go through this after 90 days, you say, you know what, Steve, it didn't work for me. Then we'll just give you your $7 back. No questions asked, seriously. But you can't do a week of it and say, nope, it didn't work and give up. You need to go through the 90 days and see if it doesn't help you go to the next stage of your journey. And so please, on your way out today, pick one of these up and get started in this next 90-day uh, journey. And I know that it's going to help you to move forward, uh, to move your spiritual life uh, down the court, down the, walk, down the road. Well, let me pray. And uh, I'm gonna jump right into this series. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. You're an amazing God. And Lord, we are just um, excited about what you're doing, not only in our church, but we're excited about what you're doing in churches all throughout this community. And I pray that your blessings will be upon every church, every congregation that's teaching about your amazing love. I pray specifically today for Oak Brook Church in Kokomo, Indiana. Thank you, God, for that incredible congregation and for their pastor, Mark Malin, and his friendship. And pray, dear God, that we can link arms together to make a difference throughout central Indiana. Now, God, as we get into your word today, I pray that you'd use it to stretch us. I pray that you'd use it to challenge us, Lord. If we have some wrong thinking or, or wrong beliefs, I just pray, dear God, that today your word would bring clarity in our life. Thanks, God. We love you and praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, as you already have heard and know, I'm starting a new series today called Unlocked, and it's really based on the book of Galatians. Uh, once a year, we do a verse-by-verse -verse study on a book. Instead of doing a topical or instead of doing a felt need we do a verse by verse. And I do that because I want, I want to get you into the word. Some of you are new believers and you've never really been taught the instruction of reading the word and studying the word. And so I'm hoping this creates a little bit of a habit in your life. We're talking about uh, the book of Galatians. Pull your notes out if you haven't already. One of the things we should have said to you last week was a reminder to bring your Bibles with you. Normally, and, and I will today as well, but we put the scriptures up here on the screen uh, but when I do a verse-by-verse -verse study like we're doing with Unlocked, I want you to bring your Bible because I want you to mark in your Bible. I want you to take notes in your Bible. And um, a lot of times people are like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't write in my Bible. It's so fresh and clean. That's what your Bible is for. Write notes in your Bible. And you say, well, what would I do when I filled it up with notes? Put it to the side, go out and buy you a new Bible and start making new notes. You know, I'm on about my fifth one, my first one in high school. I've got all of them. I filled them up with notes, and that's a good thing. You can always go back and read those notes when you're studying new books. So I want to encourage you to do that. So if you didn't bring your Bible, take notes today, and then when you go home, put those notes over in your Bible. Now, uh, the reason for the title, and I believe the reason for uh, the book of Galatians, uh, is found in chapter 5, verse 1. So what I'm telling you is that I believe this right here, this verse, is the theme to this book. And Paul, in writing this letter, he says, so Christ has truly set us free. That's the theme to the book of Galatians, our freedom in Christ. After you step across the line of faith and you invite Jesus into your life, he who the Son sets free is free. Indeed, he has set us free. So that is a big deal. So Christ has truly set us free. But then he goes on and says, now make sure that you stay free. Right there, guys, is the theme to this book. 
Because what was happening in the first century church is the same thing that's happening today. And that is, is the people, they step across the line, they invite Christ into their life, and then they start walking away from that freedom, going back into rules and regulations. And so Paul sees this happening in Galatia, and so he writes them saying, now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. So uh, if you have your Bible, underline that. If not, when you go home, highlight it with a highlighter, underline it, whatever. Christ has indeed set us free. So again, uh, we're gonna do this verse by verse study. I'm excited because whether you've been a believer for many years or whether you're a brand new Christian, I think these letters in the New Testament are there to give us a foundation to our faith and certainly to help us understand how to live as believers. It's important, you hear me say this a lot, guys, but it's important that we have a biblical worldview. It's important that we base our value system that we have a biblical worldview, but please hear me. How in the world will you ever have a biblical worldview if you never open up the book? If it sets on the, on the end table, if it sets uh, by your bed at night on the nightstand, all it's gonna do is collect dust if you never open it up. And you might boast and you might say, well, Steve, I own three Bibles. That's really good. But if you don't open any of those Bibles, it's not gonna bring change in your life. So I would encourage you, we all need a biblical worldview. Okay, let me give you some context and then we'll jump right into this. Galatians was written by the Apostle Paul, and as some of you know, Paul actually wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Now, the word apostle, when we say Apostle Paul, it just meant that he was not a pastor, but he was, in fact, a church planter. In fact, he started most of the New Testament churches. Paul was called by God to reach the Gentiles, or in other words, he was called by God to reach the non-Jew, which fortunately for us is most of us in that room. In fact, in Acts chapter 22, he says, But the Lord said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. He would go into the city. And so Paul, on these three missionary journeys, he would start churches all along the way. He would go into the city and he would start a church and then he would raise up a pastor. And after he got a pastor raised up, he'd then move on to the next city, start a church and do it all over again. He would then write letters to these churches to be an encouragement to them and to help them grow. And we call them epistles not to be mistaken as the wife of an apostle. All right, I'm sorry about that. That was really, really a bad pun. But anyway, some of you are like, what in the world does that mean? Anyway, they would usually be titled, and when he'd write these letters, they were usually titled by the name of the city. For instance, First and Second Corinthians were written to the church at Corinth. Other letters he wrote to individuals. And so, for instance, you have First and Second Timothy, who were written to Timothy, who was a young man that he had discipled. Now, it's also interesting that Martin Luther considered Galatians the most important book in the Bible. He said, the book of Galatians is like the Magna Carta of the Christian faith. It's like the Magna Carta of the Christian liberty or freedom, proclaiming to modern generations that salvation from the penalty of sin comes not by works, but by grace through faith in Christ. So about 14 years after the resurrection of Christ, Paul and Barnabas set sail from Syria to head towards the region known as Galatia. Now, Galatia is not a city, but it's a province. So I want you to get this. Galatia is not a city, but it was a province made up of two different regions. In the southern region, we find four cities that we read about in the book of Acts, Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. This is all found in an area today we know as Eastern Turkey. So Acts chapter 13 and 14, we read about Paul preaching the gospel in all four of these cities. First in the city where he heads to, or first is Antioch, and he heads into the synagogue and he starts preaching a message of grace, explaining what Jesus did for us when he died on a cross, as well as what it meant when he rose from the grave, which accomplished what the law of Moses could have never accomplished. In fact, um, here's a quote from one of his sermons. It says, therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, this is when he goes into the synagogue, okay, and this is one of his sermons. I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free. You're going to see this over and over as we do this study. It's all about freedom. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. So Paul says, hey, 
While the law of Moses couldn't accomplish this, Jesus, in fact, did. So through Jesus, we have freedom. Freedom from religion, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from sin. Now, guys, you have to realize this was a new message to these folks who had spent their lives trying to be good enough to earn God's favor. So the people like what they hear, and so they invite him back to teach at the Sabbath on the Sabbath the next week. But the religious leaders are jealous of all the attention that's being given to Paul, and so they incite a mob, incite a mob to drive Paul and Barnabas out of the city. The Bible says that basically they shake the dust off of their feet, and they then head 90 miles to the next city in Galatia called Iconium. It's basically a repeat of what had just happened in Antioch. Paul hears of a plot to stone him, so they once again hit the road, and they head about 18 more miles to Lystra. But some of these religious leaders have been following him from Antioch and Iconium, and we see what happens in Acts. He says, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and they won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. They literally stoned Paul, dragging him outside the city, thinking the guy had died. But he then, after they leave, he then awakens, and they move down the road 16 more miles to preach the gospel in another city called Derby. Now remember, he has left new believers in his wake. Every city, every community that he was in, there were people that heard the gospel message, they stepped across the line of faith, and they followed Jesus. And so there was new believers in all four of these cities. I would think, and this is just my own personal thought, I would think that he would never want to go back. I mean, my goodness, in Lystra, they left him for dead. They stoned him and left him for dead. But Paul says, you know what? I've got people back there that are new believers, and I care about them, and I don't care if I'm at risk. I'm going back. Now, that blows me away. I, w I would hope that I would have the resolve to do the same thing, but I don't know. I've never been put in that situation. And to be honest with you today, my friends, we live in a very comfortable Christianity. We live in a very comfortable world that basically we don't want our neighbors to know we're Christians. We don't want our coworkers to know we're Christians because we're afraid they might laugh at us. We're afraid they might ridicule us. And so therefore, we don't say anything. We have people that are literally walking away from their faith. Why? Because my neighbor gave me a hard time. I'm not going to follow Jesus anymore. That wasn't Paul. Paul had literally risked his life to preach the gospel. And then when they try to stone him and kill him, he lives through it and he goes back to the city so that he continue to minister to these new believers. I think that's absolutely amazing. We read on Acts 14. It says they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And listen to what he says to them a whole different message than what we're used to hearing today. He says, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. You know, it's like it, oftentimes, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, oftentimes we'll stand up here and we'll say, oh my gosh, your life will be just so wonderful if you follow Jesus. Your life's bad now, it's gonna be wonderful. Everything is just gonna be sweet. Everything's just gonna be hunky-dory. But Paul's not saying that. Paul's saying it's gonna be difficult. You're going to go through some rough times if you follow Christ, but that's what it means to be a follower of Christ. And I think it's important that all of us begin to understand that uh, as well. Okay, so what's going on now? Paul's gone. He's finished these journeys. He's back. What's going on that makes Paul want to write to these new believers? Well, Paul gets word that there's a group of people that claim to be Christians, but they were Jewish Christians, also known as Judaizers who were teaching Jesus, but adding that you also had to keep the Jewish rituals or the old religious system to be saved or to have favor with God. So these new Christians are being led back to religion or the idea that you had to do something to earn favor with God. That completely frustrates Paul. Because again, the message of the gospel is that he who the Son sets free is free indeed, that when I accepted Christ in my life, I'm free of all that. It's not because of anything I've done, but because of what he's done. He paid the price. But these Judaizers are telling him, oh, no, 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 no. Jesus is wonderful, but there's some other things that you've got to do to be a Christian. And so people say, well, Steve, why are we even talking about this? We don't have Judaizers today. We don't have 
Jewish Christians coming in and doing that, but I will promise you, my friends, the church in America is full of those that would come in to say, oh yeah, we love Jesus, but it's Jesus plus this. It's Jesus plus that. They'll tell you all these other rules and regulations that you have to be faithful to keep if you want a ticket to heaven. And so we have that same type of false teaching that's going on uh, today. And as you can imagine, Paul is not happy about any of this. He loves these people. He risked his life so they could discover a relationship with Christ. But now these false teachers come along and they're leading them back into the bondage of work, works back into the burden of religion. So in this first chapter, you can just almost, as you read it, you can almost feel Paul's frustration as he writes this. He opens his letter uh, with a short greeting. We're not going to take time to read it. He opens with a short greeting, and then he quickly jumps into the purpose of the writing. So we'll pick it up at verse 6. He says, I am astonished. You can feel the frustration. Paul's saying, I'm blown away. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really... Paul says, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I'm shocked, I'm blown away that you would so quickly desert the truth. Now, to desert is just what we would think. It's the idea of leaving one side and going to the other and then fighting on the other side. It's the idea, basically, guys, of a traitor. So Paul is making it clear that you are leaving the gospel I taught you to go to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. What's he saying? The word gospel literally means good news. So what Paul is saying to them is he says, you're leaving. I taught you about the good news of Jesus. You're leaving the good news of Jesus to go to some different gospel, which is not good news. So it's not really a gospel at all. And so these Judaizers are teaching, uh, It was certainly not good news. In fact, it was a perversion. He calls it, Paul says, it's a perversion of the truth. Guys, remember, the Judaizers taught Jesus. I want you to remember that because, again, you see it. Churches are full of people that are doing this. The Judaizers taught Jesus. They just taught that Jesus wasn't enough. In other words, Jesus is cool. He's just not enough. So it's Jesus plus following the laws. But most of these new converts were Gentiles, and so they were unfamiliar with all the laws and all the religious rules that the Jews kept. So the Judaizers are saying to them, in order to be a Christian, you have to follow Jesus, and you have to keep all the laws. So that means you still have to be circumcised. And at that moment, all the men dropped out of the membership class. (laughs) And they're like, honey... You know what? You go and you take notes and you come tell me all about it. I'm going to be waiting on the car. Listen, guys, there was over 600 Old Testament laws they they were required to keep if they wanted God's favor. So here you've got this young Jewish boy. From the time they're young, these these, uh, Jewish boys have to memorize these laws. And they were taught they have to keep these laws if they want God's favor. There were ceremonial laws, civil laws, and moral laws. In 70 AD, the Jewish rabbis added, get this, they added another 341 rules for daily life. Guys, please hear me on this. You can keep all of the laws and still not be good enough to please God. Please hear me. You can can keep all of these laws, hundreds of laws, and still not be good enough to please God. You see, no one is ever going to be good enough on their own efforts. Now, I don't want to get ahead of next week's message, but this is exactly what Paul's trying to say to him when we get into chapter two. Look at it, verse 16. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. We know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you're made right not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we've obeyed the law. He just keeps saying it. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. And you're like, okay already, Paul, we get it. We get it. But he just keeps saying this over and over again. Guys, the law cannot keep us from sinning and the law cannot save us from sin. Yes, It can make us conscious of sin. It can help us to realize our need for a savior, but it cannot make us right with God. So Paul says, guys, 
Trying to put requirements to salvation is a perversion of the gospel. That's some pretty heavy words. That, that's, that's a pretty serious accusation. Trying to put requirements to salvation is a perversion of the gospel. So guys, please hear me on this. Look up here. Please hear me on this. Whenever you hear someone say this, whenever you hear someone say, real Christians don't smoke, real Christians don't drink, real Christians don't go to movies, real Christians aren't obese, real Christians don't do drugs, real Christians don't have sex outside of marriage, real Christians don't cuss or chew or go with girls that do. <laughs> Seriously though, guys, when you hear somebody say that, it is a perversion of the gospel. And listen, if you have said that to somebody, you are perverting the gospel. Now, I'm not saying those things won't cause a problem. That's a whole nother message. I'm not trying to tell you that all those things that I didn't just list are, are important for us to deal with. I understand that. I'm just trying to get you to see that they have nothing to do with our salvation. It's also a perversion of the gospel when you try to add requirements to salvation, it's Jesus plus commission, excuse me, it's Jesus plus communion. It's Jesus plus church attendance. It's Jesus plus baptism. It's Jesus plus confession. Again, do you see guys that also perverts the gospel? Or maybe you hear real Christians don't have abortions. Real Christians aren't gay. Real Christians don't look at pornography. Real Christians love their neighbor. Real Christians help the poor. I could go on and on and on and on. Certainly, all of these things are a problem and they need to be looked at and they need to be addressed in your life. And correcting all of these things are a part of good discipleship and they're a part of growing in our faith, but they have nothing to do with defining a real Christian. A real Christian is someone who has put their hope and their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's Christ and Christ alone. Now, I know this is making some of you mad. I get that. I know that there's some of you hearing it, and you don't want to hear this uh, because I'm making it too easy. You, you want to be able to use some of these things as an excuse to, to, to push somebody, as an excuse to get something out of somebody. But Jesus says clearly in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He doesn't say except through me plus you gotta do this. Except through me plus you should include, include this. Jesus is the only one, we've talked about that a lot. Jesus is the only one that can bridge the gap. None of these other activities, none of these other things that people try to hold over our head are gonna bridge the gap, only Jesus. You cannot add any requirements to salvation other than him. It is Christ and Christ alone. The gospel is not about what you are to do. Hear me. The gospel is not about what you are to do. It's about what Jesus has already done. And when you put faith in what Jesus has already done, there is forgiveness of sins. Listen, works, works says, if I obey, then God will love me and accept me. Grace says, I'm loved and accepted, therefore, I want to obey. Listen, if you were here during our last series, we just got through talking about for several weeks, the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. One of the things you did not hear me say is he did not say, hey guys, I got it started, you go finish it. I got it started, you go finish it, absolutely not. What were the last words Jesus spoke? It is finished. It is finished. Finished. What was finished? The work of salvation has been finished. It has been accomplished. Now, guys, this is a big problem in the church world today. We say we, we say we know that it's Christ and Christ alone. We say we know that it's only through Jesus, but we oftentimes gravitate back towards things that we add to it. We oftentimes, I, I hear it all the time. I hear it around me all the time, and people are saying, well, you know, he's not a Christian because... He's not a Christian because he does this. She's not a Christian because she does that. It has nothing to do with whether he or she is or isn't a Christian. Well, the reason he or she is a Christian is because they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. There may be sin in their life. There may be things they need to clean up, things they need to work on, but it has nothing to do with their salvation. Listen, once we are saved, there is no question, and please don't misunderstand, there is no question that our lives should change. We should start reflecting Jesus the more we grow. I mean, it's like when I accepted Jesus, maybe I was far from God, I was living in sin, I was hurting a lot of family, I was hurting a lot of different people, but when I stepped across the line of faith, I turned and I went the other way. I turned and went the other direction, and so therefore, changes should start taking place. 
because I should start being a reflection of Christ. But salvation, the salvation piece is through Christ alone. To add anything to it, it's taking Christianity and it's turning it into a type of religion that requires something out of you to earn favor with God. Christianity is certainly not another religion. Christianity is a relationship with a living God. Verse eight, he says, but even if we, Paul's frustrated. And, and, and now that if you go back and read chapter one with the idea that he's frustrated, I think you'll feel it. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said, so now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Again, he repeats it twice. He says, he said, listen to me. He's like, hear me on this. If you're preaching any other gospel, may you be cursed. He says, guys, to pervert the gospel is a very serious thing. And I don't care if there's an angel from heaven himself that comes down and teaches this and preaches that. He said, it's, I pray that God's curse would be on them. Friends, I don't know what God's curse is. I just know I don't want it. And I hope you don't either. Verse 10, he goes on. He says, and I, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. And so these Judaizers are trying to discredit Paul. You know, you know, people are listening to him. They don't like it that they're listening to him. So they try to discredit him by accusing him of preaching an incomplete gospel so that he might gain, uh, he's, they're saying he's preaching this incomplete gospel so that he can gain favor with the Gentiles. So Paul makes it clear that he's not trying to impress anyone. He's simply trying to share with them the truth of the good news, the truth of the gospel. He made it clear that his message had never wavered and that he would never do anything to be a people pleaser. He was never going to do anything just to make people happy with him. He's going to teach the truth of the gospel regardless what the Judaizers were saying. And he wants them to know that this message came directly from Christ. He goes on and he says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preach is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul's message came from God's revelation, not from human imagination. And so Paul is going to use his own story as evidence of the power of gospel. Listen to me, guys. Before Paul was a believer, he was a very bad guy. Before Paul was a believer, he was a very bad guy to Christians. The scripture said, you know, that the Lord's followers were, were scattered. I mean, after Jesus was crucified on a cross, uh, there, were, there were thousands of people that were coming to Christ, thousands of people that were stepping across the line of faith. And the Romans increased their persecution. And so therefore, uh, the, the Christians were scattering. They were running for their own safety into different regions and to different areas. And so um, Paul was one of those men that was out to kill him. Paul was a rising star among the Jews and among the uh, Romans, among the Sanhedrin. And, and so he had, was given official authority, papers, that he, and he had soldiers with him. And he was traveling to these different areas, finding Christians and having them arrested. Okay? <clears throat> and so what we see <clears throat> is the first person martyred in the Bible was Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr. In fact, look in Acts chapter 7. He says, they dragged him. We're talking about Stephen. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So before Paul was Paul, Paul, God changed his name to Paul after he became a believer. But before that, his name was Saul. And so on this particular day, they drag Stephen, who is a strong believer in his faith, and they drag him out and they're going to kill him. They're going to murder him. They're going to martyr him for his faith. But of course, you can't do that. That's illegal, right? That's against the law. But Paul, Saul back then, had the official papers to give permission for a mob to put this man to death. And so what do they do? They take off their coats and they throw it at the feet of Saul that signifies we're going to kill this guy and you're giving us the permission. So it's not illegal to murder this man because you're giving us the permission. 
So while Paul may have not picked up a stone, he may not have thrown the rock at Stephen, he was just as guilty, if not more guilty, than all of the people that day. Paul is saying, listen to me, only a resurrected savior with real power can explain a conversion experience of Christianity's number one enemy into its number one ambassador for Christ. Paul was a sworn enemy that hated believers with every fiber within his being, and he was transformed into his greatest advocate. Paul's life on the road to Damascus, if you know that story, Paul's traveling with orders to go arrest Christians, and while he's on this road to Damascus, God knocks him off his high horse and speaks to him, gets his attention, and at that point, Paul repents of his sins, totally changes him. So here you have this man that was angry with Christians, angry with God, and now he accepts him, he turns and goes 180 degrees the other way. Paul says, I was a hater, and now I'm a promoter. Verse 13. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many <clears throat> of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. And so regardless of what you've done, my friends, listen to me. You, some of you are out there and you're saying, you know what, I, there's no way I could ever become a believer. Steve, you have no idea how I've messed up. You don't have any idea how many people I've hurt. There's no way God would ever forgive me. Paul killed people. He had people put to death. He had people beaten and whipped because they were Christians. And yet God used him in an amazing way. If God can use him, I'm telling you, he can use you. God can forgive him. I promise you, my friends, he can forgive you. So regardless what you've done, <clears throat> we're all hopelessly lost in our sins in need of a savior. But the good news is no one is beyond his amazing grace. I read a blog just not long ago written by Russell Moore, and I loved this little section in his blog. It said this. He said, you never know. When we talk about how God is going to use people and you think about the story of Paul and how God transformed his life, he said, the next Billy Graham might just be a drunk right now. The next Charles Wesley might just be a profanity-spewing hip-hop artist right now. The next Charles Spurgeon might just be managing an abortion clinic today. The next Mother Teresa might just be a heroin-addicted porn star. The next Apostle Paul might just be involved in the occult right now. But friends, the hope we all hold to, hold to is that the Spirit of the Lord has the power to transform any and every life. Just like what God did with the apostles. They're a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Here you had uh, one uh, uh, betrayed him, but you had 11 men that were left, 11 ordinary men that were fishermen. They were blue collar workers who were afraid uh, after Jesus was arrested. And so here are these guys, they're following Jesus. They've been traveling with him for three years. They're like family and they keep telling Jesus, I mean, if anything happens to you, Jesus, we want you to know we've got your back. And then all of a sudden they come in that night to the garden and they arrest Jesus. And what do these guys do? Instead of having his back, they all run in fear, afraid they're going to be the next one, frightened, scared to death. But then three days later, after Jesus rose from the grave and conquered death, and all of a sudden they see that the resurrection proved that Jesus was exactly who he said he was, that he was indeed the Messiah. Now all of a sudden, these scared, frightened little men are willing to lay down their lives. And they begin to preach the gospel. They begin to go into every region preaching the gospel. They were beaten. They were imprisoned. They were whipped but they continued to preach the gospel. They did not let anything detour or to discourage them. They continued to preach the gospel. In fact, all of them were martyred for their faith. They all died. If we had time, I'd go through the list. They all died a horrible, horrendous death, except for John. John was banned to the Isle of Patmos, but everyone else died a horrible martyr's death. But they refused. Peter was one example. Peter I was crucified on a cross, but he said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. So he demanded that they crucify him upside down. I mean, this, they went from scared little men to men that were willing to take a stand for Jesus because they knew the resurrection proved that he was indeed the Messiah. How does that happen? By the transforming power of Jesus Christ. So friends, I don't know what you've done in the past or what sins you've committed, but I do know that God loves you and he wants to change your life. And that's why Paul was reminding us of his own story. Someone said, someone said the gospel of grace is like water. People didn't invent it and yet people can't live without it. We are spiritually thirsty creatures in need of the living water the gospel provides. 
And as believers, we need to keep drinking from the well of grace. Now, the Judaizers were also trying to discredit Paul by saying that he had plagiarized his message from bits and pieces that he'd heard from the other apostles. And that Paul's gospel was different than what the other apostles were preaching. Of course, there was no truth to this, but Paul defends this. Uh, he says that he hasn't even been around the other apostles. How could I be taking their teaching? I haven't even been around them or read any of their writings. So how could he be plagiarizing? So he says, but when God who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. He said, I, I didn't immediately consult with anybody about this. He goes on verse 17, he says, I did, I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia, important. I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, that's important, three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. So Paul wants them to understand that, what he, that he was directly taught by Jesus in the wilderness for three years. Paul was directly taught by Jesus in the wilderness of Arabia for three years. In other words, Paul's seminary training came directly from the Holy Spirit. Listen, Paul spent those years alone in the desert with God, praying, studying, growing, learning, as well as unlearning, as well as unlearning everything he'd been taught all of his life. Listen, guys, sometimes unlearning is as important as learning. Most of our values and beliefs come from our family and our surroundings. So if you weren't raised in a Christian home, then your worldview is not gonna be a Christian worldview. If your family didn't teach you these values and now you've stepped across the line of faith, you've got a whole lot of baggage that you're carrying from childhood. A lot of beliefs that are wrong there you're carrying from childhood. And so part of your spiritual growth is to unlearn some of those things and to begin to understand the truth of God's word, which is why, oh my goodness, which is why as parents, we have such a big responsibility to train our kids up in the way they should go. I could camp right here for a long time. Listen to me, moms and dads. I cannot overstate, I cannot overemphasize the importance as parents to you to train up your kids in the way they should go. Kids need to learn spiritual values and principles at home. I know that some of you say, well, Steve, come on. That's why we bring them to church. It's your responsibility to teach them their spiritual values. So you're telling me that you believe your kids' values can all be formed in one to two hours a week. I'm telling you that isn't gonna happen. I'm telling you, moms and dads, you're still the biggest influence in your children's lives. I don't care what you hear anywhere else. You're a bigger influence than the television. You're a bigger influence than their teachers. You're a bigger influence than their friends, than video games, than anything else. You're still the biggest influence and you're either gonna influence them spiritually to follow Christ or by your apathy and indifference, you're gonna influence them that it's not that big of a deal or not that important. And so that's why it's so important to pour into your children. And so I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, especially in the day and age we live where the culture is fighting against us. But that's why we came up with the family framework is because we wanna come alongside you and help. And so there's different, uh, different markers in your life or in your kids' lives. And so every one of those markers, we have a plan to help you, to teach you, to show you exactly what you should do biblically to help your child through this particular marker in life. And so I hope that you won't ignore that. I hope that you will engage and become a part of the family framework so that we can together see your kids love God and follow God. So it was during the three years in Arabia, the three years in the desert, that Christ really made himself known to Paul. In fact, uh, Paul doesn't even know. It was so real that Paul doesn't even know if it was a vision or if he actually was taken up into the presence of Christ. It was so real. In fact, look at 2 Corinthians 12. He says, I know a man, this is Paul writing this. He says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I just don't know, God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I, I don't know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible things, things that no one is permitted to tell. But after those three years, he goes to Jerusalem and he sees Peter and he, stay, and he stays there and begins to preach for the next 15 days. So we go back to Galatians and it says, then I went to Syria 
and Silsa, Sil, whatever. And, <laughs> and I was personally, I've tried to say that. I had it down before service started and I just still, I've got a mental block on it. So you just figure it out yourself. So I went to Syria, I went to Syria and there, and then I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. This is a big deal. So remember, Paul was the man that was out killing them. He was persecuting Christians. He had the authority to put them to death. And now all of a sudden they hear, he's not doing that anymore. He's preaching the gospel. And so they're like, this is a trick. I know it's a trick. We gotta be careful of this guy. He's just trying to catch us. And so Paul is saying, they only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. I mean, you can, all, you can imagine how it built their faith to think, oh my gosh, you're kidding me. Saul is now a believer. He's a Christian. And so he continued to share his story and news spread quickly that this guy who used to persecute Christians is now following Jesus. Two different times in Acts, we see Paul share his testimony, his story of how he came to Christ on the Damascus Road, which I already shared with you, traveling to kill Christians. God knocked him off his high horse and his life was radically changed. Listen, guys, every single one of us has a conversion story. If you're a believer today, if you're a Christian today, every single one of us has a conversion story. Do you know what that is? You say, well, I mean, yeah, I was there. I know what it is. Could you tell somebody what your conversion story is? Because here's the concern I got, is that so many people today that are Christians and they know they're on their way to heaven and somebody says, tell me about it. And they hem all around. They say, well, I don't know what happened. I don't know how long ago, some years ago. And, and this is what happened. Well, no, that wasn't there. It was here. Guys, I cannot encourage you enough. If you are a believer, you need to come up with a three minute story. You need your story to be down in three minutes. I have one that I tell uh, when I speak it in public, people ask me to share my story. It takes me 45 minutes to share that story. I rarely use it. I mean, who wants to listen to me talk for 45 minutes about my story? But I use my three minute story all the time, all the time. Because, it, because God gives you more opportunities in a short window to share your story with others. So I cannot encourage you, please don't let apathy or indifference get in the way. Every one of you, if you don't know what it is, go home and write it out. Write it out, learn it, bring it down to just a short story that you can tell on an elevator going from the ground floor up. Find out what that is and, I, and you will be surprised how often that God gives you an opportunity to share it. That's why we do... We just did a story on Annette and shared her story about the growth plan. We do stories all the time. Why do we do that? Because I want you to see, if you'll notice, and you maybe have never noticed, all those stories are three minutes or less. Why? Because I want you to see that the story, we, we heard this person's story, we got it in three minutes or less. So you can tell someone's story in that short amount of time. So find out what yours is, write it down, and begin to share it. Stories have such an impact on people. Guys, listen to me. As we finish up chapter one, the main takeaway today that I hope you've gotten a hold of is that you cannot add or take away from salvation. It is a free gift of God. There's absolutely nothing you can do to earn it. And there's certainly nothing you can do to deserve it. Salvation is found, hear me, salvation is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Cannot add anything to it. No matter what anybody tries to tell you, when Jesus breathed his last, he was saying, it is finished. I've already accomplished the work. There's nothing else that you can do. There's nothing else that can be done. We'll pick up chapter two next week. Once a month, we have what we call, uh, for those of you that are new to our church, we have what we call our miracle prayer time because we believe in a miracle working God. I believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he worked miracles in the Old Testament. He worked miracles in the New Testament. He's still working miracles today. What is a miracle? A miracle is when God steps into your situation. You're at the end of your rope, you've hit a wall, and God steps into your situation. Some of you need a miracle. You need a miracle. You need a miracle um, in your finances, in your marriage, whatever. And so we wanna agree with you today in prayer. And it's not a counseling session, so it's not gonna be like, we don't wanna hear your story. Just come up and say, pray for my marriage, and they'll agree with you. Pray for my finances, and they'll agree with you. And so the lines go fast. So if you uh, need a miracle today, I hope you'll take an extra minute or two and let us agree with you in prayer. So I'm gonna ask you to stand and I've asked some people to come help me pray if they would make their way up. If all of you would stand with me, please. 
Father, thank you for your faithfulness. You are an amazing God. And I thank you, Lord, that our salvation is found in you and you alone, that there's nothing else that we can add to it. And he who the Son sets free is free indeed. God, I pray now that as we go into a new week, that you'll help us to be lights in a dark world, that you'll help us to represent you well in all that we do. God, give us the boldness. Give us the boldness of Saul. Give us the boldness of Paul when his life was radically changed. Thanks, Lord. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Have a great week.